Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 60. As always, my name is Mark, and today there is a room full of people. We got five podcasters, one microphone. I'm Mark. Let's go to the left. We have Lindsay. Say something vocal, not a thumbs up. (laughs) Um, hi. We have Matt. Hey, episode 60. That's a prime number. (laughs) What? (laughs) What? Matthew. Oh, no, I'm ashamed. I know. I'm ashamed from last time I said that. Ben. 60. Ooh. And Amber. Not prime. Hi, everyone. Did you just seriously no, call I it even that, number I said, prime? I, th- I think 53 was the last. Yeah, 53 is prime. No, no, no. Not, uh, oh, 50, no. 57. 57, 57 was the last discussion. one I was on. And I, I mistakenly, said, mistakenly that said that's prime, and I was ashamed. Oh, okay. So, so you're okay. redeeming so yourself call, by call. making an even more egregious. <laughs> that's sin. right. Yes. Sixty is actually kind of a fun number because it's divisible by two, three, four, five, and six. Yes, it is. It is a very fun number, um, especially for <laughs> and by. Is it divisible by? Close to the unfun numbers. By twelve, also. Yeah, twelve and five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Boom. That's divisible by a lot. And for th- those number. people out there all into, uh, what is it, what's the, like, your your base decimal, like, what's the, do, when you change, like, there's binary, there's ten. That's decimal? Your base. That's, that's the base. base oh, base. base yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's like, a contingent, small contingent of people, contingency of people who are really into base 12 because it is more divisible by things. Yeah. In which case, 60 is a cool I want to hear them. someone who's really into that fight with someone who's really into base 16. Didn't number... Wait, 16 is a thing. Number file did a like thing on base 12, 12, and it was really I interesting. I, I'd like to say, if you haven't turned off the podcast by now, um, what is it? Fermat's Library is a Twitter account. That tweets just really interesting things about this. They had one that was super interesting about factors of numbers the other day. So, if you haven't turned us off, you should follow Fermat's library on Twitter. Fascinating. <laughs> Very nice. Fascinating. Well, I remember on the number file video, they're talking about how there are, there were some cultures that developed a base 12 system, you know, on islands and whatever. And mm-hmm. what happened was they didn't count with their fingers, they counted with their knuckles. Oh, wow. Minus the thumb. They're four finger knuckles, so four times three. So they used a base 12 system. Ben's over here making fun of us silently <laughs> until a sweet until, that's factoid really cool. like that gets dropped. All I do are drop cool facts. I drop some awesome facts about the economic realities of the Great Depression and World War II and the broken window fallacy to some middle schoolers last week. <laughs> It blew their minds. They literally wrote it, wrote it down to look up later. I was very excited. You should tell the story that you told us all earlier about your middle schoolers. Oh, I should. of the world. Before we even get more into this podcast, let's keep going off topic. So, I coach debate, or I teach debate for middle schoolers, and there was a group today, earlier today, that were debating the topic... Uh, the internet is harmful to society. And one side had presented arguments about how the internet's a really useful educational tool. You can find information very easily. You can look up stuff uh, much more easily than without the internet. And the other side came up <laughs> in, during cross-examination, did a line of cross-examination about, well, you said you can look up you know, facts and information online, but how do you know they're true? And Good question, Good question. I was like, oh, this is, this is getting cool. And the kid actually had a great response. And he's like, well, one time I was working on something and I looked up uh, something online. And then I checked in my history book and the history book confirmed it. And then <laughs> the kid goes, well, how do you know the history book is true? <laughs> and he's like, well, we talked about it in class also. And the teacher confirmed it. And then the uh, the person asking says, "Well, how do you know the teacher was saying the truth?" And the and the kid was like, oh, I, "I don't know," and he kind of stammered a bit. And then I saw on their faces for the briefest split second this moment of epistemological dread and horror <laughs> as they realized <laughs> the direction the train they were going on was. <laughs> 
and then he immediately went on to a different line of questioning. <laughs> Just ignored it. <laughs> it was like they saw it, and they both like simultaneously turned around and ran away. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I'm corrupting the children. Not to be like nihilist, but to question things. <laughs> Anyways, this is a game about... Bo- or this is a podcast about board games. Clearly. It's a game of a podcast about board games. In and it of itself, is it also a game? To be determined. We're going to be talking about interpersonal trading games uh, today because we've been playing some, and then I realized we'd played a few of them, and then I realized that, hey, that's a topic we haven't covered. Uh, so we just f- finished playing for the second time Trade on the Tigris, which is gave me the impetus for this topic. And yeah, we're going to go into games where you trade with each other. Before we go into that, I'd like to point out that the podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, who are awesome. And if you'd like to become one of them, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. You get all kinds of cool stuff, along with the feeling of satisfaction of knowing that you've given me money. And... <laughs> including being able to watch us record these podcasts live. And hanging out in the Discord. Did you mention that? And hanging out in the Discord, yeah. Yeah, We talk about uh, games and and our Magic the Gathering Arena decks and our draft foibles and all kinds of fun stuff. So again, patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Also, I might as well point this out. Uh, If anyone out there owns a board gaming company, like publishing or accessories or whatever, and you would like to have... And you would like to advertise on the Thoughtful Gamer? Email me, Mark at the Thoughtful Gamer dot com. I'm looking for additional revenue streams, not to diminish the patrons, but to make everything more awesome. But I will like the patrons better because they're cool. Anyways, trading games. Let's talk about them. So we just finished trading on the Tigris or trade on the Tigris uh, by Jeff. Engelstein and Ryan Sturm, I believe is the pronunciation of his name, the game created on the Ludology podcast. Uh, There are three other, I would argue, what I would call a trading game, although this is going to create a conflict, but I like to point them out. In other words, they're, they're really centered around trading. And again, we're talking about interpersonal trading, not like resource exchange with the game, but actually trading things with other players. So we have Trade on the Tigris. We have Sidereo Confluence, which I love. Uh, Chinatown, the classic kind of, I, I think, most elegant implementation of this. And then Catan. Before we what? talk about that last one, because I know Matt has disagreements here, <laughs> there are four other games I thought of that I wouldn't call a trading game, but have aspects of trading to various degrees uh, that I think have good illustrations to point out. Those are Pandemic, Colosseum, Twilight Imperium and Millennium Blades. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So, we'll get to that later. So why isn't Pit on your list? Oh yeah, because I've not played Pit. You haven't played Pit with my we'll, family. We'll talk about Pit. We can talk about. Well, I'm, okay. I'm going to add it to the list right now. <laughs> you, we discussed this on on the Slack, and you did not mention Pit. Um, yeah. You got to be on the Slack. I'm behind remember. on the Slack. Very behind. Pit's I, my go-to for explaining. Like I explain Tigris trade on Tigris. Uh, to some, like, sort of gaming friends. Um, and basically, like, Pit is what I use. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we were playing Pit and tried to get you to join, and you refused because you saw the mass chaos. Yeah, it's chaotic, right? We can talk right? about this. Okay, so let's talk first. Let's get it out of the way. Matt has some kind of disagreement with my classification of Wait. Catan as a trading game, Wait. which I do not understand. Matt disagreeing with Mark? What is this? What is this podcast Spe- coming to? Specifically about a definition. This might be the first time ever. <laughs> no, I think... Yeah, so when when you were throwing out ideas about trading games, I think, I think our disagreement actually isn't that big. I think it's a more of a disagreement of degrees. When I, when I think of trading game, in quotes, you can't see that I'm doing air quotes over here. <laughs> it makes me think of like like a very focused genre, maybe. Sure. In which trading is the central mechanism. For me, Catan, trading is certainly an an element, even a big element, but it isn't fundamental enough to to what the game is for me to call it a trading game. It's, to me, it's, it's a euro of sorts that 
has important trading aspects. Um, okay, but so <laughs> I don't understand how it's different than something like trade on the Tigris. You get a random allocation of goods. Yeah. You are able to trade those with other players, and you turn in sets so, of those goods in order to get victory points. Like, that's like the you definition you, of it. You don't, though. You do. Well, you don't. Everything in Catan is turning in sets of goods to get victory For, points. Yeah, but I think... Or, I think not the, necessarily. Or abilities. I think, I think the yeah. waters are, are muddier in, in Catan because you're building up a physical uh, network... That sure, there's also, the geographic aspect. It, it also happens to be in your your, um, your victory points, but it's also your resource collection mechanism. Uh, yeah. I think the fact that you could manipulate enough in the trading phase to just dominate the game would help me classify it more as a trading game. Like, if you were yeah. good enough at trading or yeah. like manipulating your other players to be able to Well, trade, it's also... Here's, would, here's the thing for me. It's also so significant that it's a very common thing in Catan to just stop trading with who you think is about to win the game. Yeah, but it's also common to have no desire to initiate trades and just not. And so that's po- never happened. Like, po- in my my, yeah, my it, plays of Kadan well, have been dominated cer- by trade. It certainly happens. Well, yeah, and, and also I think maybe different groups have more or less aversion to trade. Maybe I play with more trade-averse groups. Um Back when I played Gatan. A lot of people are trade averse. I don't get it. Every game yeah. I've played, everyone yeah. trades. Yeah, the point was you know, the point was made uh in, in preparation that you can play Gatan without trading. Um I, it's I, really hard. Yeah. But it'd be a shell of a it's, game. It's it's hard, but it's you're still you're kind of you're managing an engine. And I think maybe maybe that's the heart of of why I don't think trade is the central piece of Catan is because I see it as a game of managing an engine. But it's barely an engine. Yeah. yeah. But the trade is also but I think less you, significant than than I think a lot of, of it, trading is. It's less memorable, too. Yeah. I haven't played yeah. Catan in a very, very, very long time, and I don't remember it as a trading game. When it made your list, I was actually right. very surprised. Yeah. But within the trade phase, like games can be won or lost within Catan. Like, if someone's just not understanding it's also, of the value it's also of the resources... Not, it's not is, like, open trade, which, which actually, like, just when I heard trading game... The thing that I immediately thought of was like a game that has that the trade floor is open moment. Yeah. And it doesn't have that. The trade is focused around the person who, the, the active player who is allowed to initiate trades. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, well, yeah. it's the only game among your trade-focused games that has player turns, for example. During the trade, yeah. At all. Fair. At all. I think there's... To me, there's something there's something different about the kind of just open floor, kind of stock market, Wall Street feel. Sure. You know, that, that, that these other have. Now, back to my opening statement. This is really... An argument of degrees. And oh, oh so, that's so, what I was about to say. So, so like, like, definitely... I would say without question, Catan is the least trading game of the five trading games in your list. I completely agree. And, and it's close. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. No, it's a matter of degrees. Whether or not we yeah. call it a trade game is depends on your definition of trade game, right? It's just a semantic argument at that point. Yeah. But I think, and, and it's interesting. I think well, after it, the second just... play of Trade on the Tigris, Trade on the Tigris is closer to the bottom of that list with Catan. Than I originally would have put it. Yes. Um, although still significantly above it, I would draw the line below trade on the Tigris, but, uh, you know. Yeah, whatever. So, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but it's a good illustration of what we keep saying about definitions and words, right? It's it's interesting to define things insofar as it helps you understand oh. something. So, right, yeah. we understand something more about Catan versus these other games where it, what what we categorize it at doesn't matter at all. So let's talk about trade in general, because as the person who has studied economics more than anyone else, you know, trade is foundational. More than anyone else ever. <laughs> in this room. 
Perhaps. Now, you didn't take many econ. You went business focused, right, Amber? But who has the most experience with trade in games? Practical economics. Well, I'm not going to guess that. <laughs> if, since you're saying that, it's probably you, because you alluded to playing. You definitely a lot relish a taking advantage of another trading partner more than anyone in this room. <laughs> well, I, I point this out because trade is is foundational to economics. It's foundational to. It's such an awesome thing because when you have a trade, you're literally creating wealth. If you have a free trade. You're creating wealth because value is subjective and you're getting rid of something you value relatively less to gain something you value relatively more. And the same thing happens to the other person. So, the, you know, when Adam Smith writes The Wealth of Nations, it's a question. Like, the natural state of humanity is to be poor, and yet we've built up civilization over time and now we're wealthy. How on earth does that happen? And the answer is largely trade. So trade is such a cool, special thing to me. So in a game, the same rules apply, right? People aren't going to agree to a trade unless there's a perceived mutual benefit. Now, certain games like Trade on the Tigris can distort that because it allows deception, which, you know, in in real life you try to, through legal means, prohibit. (laughs) We call this fraud. Uh, but trading the Tigris allows some fraud, so it creates some more interesting stuff within the game. But typically, yeah, both sides are going to benefit. Um, so it can be a very strong benefit in the game, which is where I, I look to Pandemic. So Pandemic has the tiniest bit of trade possible in that you can trade cards in very, very constrained parameters. <laughs> Matt's raising his hand. Yeah, I question have a comment. Matt. I was... More shocked that you include Pandemic at all on this list than that you included <laughs> Catan among the actual trading games. Well, what I did is I went down, I, I went to Board Game Geek and just filtered by trade games and then ranked by number of votes, so most popular, the least popular. Yeah. And then just went down and I saw Pandemic. I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh yeah, you can do that. And then I thought of this point, so I included it. One thing interesting to note is that, like, we've played most of the all but one or two of like the primary trading games that are popular, at least on Board Game Geek. I think I went down to like a thousand votes on Board Game Geek in the trading games, and I would say twenty five percent of them were expansions and variants of Catan. Hmm. Huh. Wow! Like there aren't that many, which I think is interesting. I think part of it is because trade is very strong, because both sides benefit. Yeah. When it when that kind of activity happens, the other players at the table don't benefit relatively, so they lose in game terms. That's all I'm saying with the with the pandemic thing. Like if yeah. if trading was easier in pandemic, it would the game would have to be substantially altered because it is so powerful. I th- there are some weird things about that. I feel like pandemic is labeled as trade just because there's an action called trade. Right, that's how uh, that's how board game geek works. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. Ex- if you're classified under a mechanism, it doesn't exclude the others. Yeah. So each game will have a list of mechanisms that it's included under. Uh, so no, any I game mean, with I a trading mean, element I mean, is I mean included. That the, it's actually called trade, like on your player aid. Mm. The action is called trade. It's barely trade in the in the sense of you know what what you're talking about of sharing perceived value. It's also a cooperative game, which is super interesting. And just the idea of trade in a cooperative game is interesting. Yeah. One thing that provides a challenge in board games with trade is that it requires people to have different values for things. And one thing that designers do, and rightly so, particularly in resource-type Euro games, is they'll essentially either explicitly, like with Zulkin, or not shown to the players, they will value things a certain way. Um, And that will be in their spreadsheets behind the scenes. Like, I know, like, games like Hearthstone and Magic do this kind of thing, where different abilities have different values, and they actually calculate things to figure out costs, or to help figure out costs, or know when something's on the margin. But in order for trade to happen, people have to value things differently. And so you have to figure out a way to both balance the game on one sense and and have some way 
to generate, to figure out how much resources ought to be valued in terms of victory points and have the players have different valuations of those things during the game. So I found two ways this, this happens. First is by providing inherently different values for the players. And the closest thing I get to this is sidereal, right? Because yeah. you have your machines, and they those machines value different resources in different ways. So someone might be really strong all in on one type of resource, and they use that resource super efficiently, um, and it's just given to you at the beginning of the game. The other way, which all the other games that I've listed fall into, is that it emerges that you want to be strategically distinct from other players, and therein lies the value. And, I, and that's almost always, or actually always is, at least in these examples, a, a kind of set collection. So you want to specialize. So on Trade on the Tigris, the value of things increases as you accumulate more of them, and then it starts to decelerate again, which is interesting. In Catan, you could just have different strategies. So if someone's going for cities, they're going to get different. They're going to value different resources different than someone going more heavily towards the cards, whatever they're called. Well, development, what's the, cards. Development, development cards. Development cards. That's yeah. what they're called. Yeah. Is it really the only game where like? Your what you're actually outputting is generally what you don't actually want yourself, and that you know you have to actually kind of trade it because it's basically useless to you. That's is another that, good point that I that didn't really... I didn't well, think of. We, we in in Trade on the Tigris we had those um, some of the cards give you cards that you cannot yourself use, and oh, you're fair. forced to trade yeah. them away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, actually, actually, actually that okay, that's sorry. a mechanism uh, that Sidiro uses as well. Is yeah. is. Like donation. specifically give you things oh, that donation you have no value use. until you lose, and that's kind of artificially um, creating that real effect that trade has. Actually, in Twilight Imperium, value. in Twilight Imperium, that's all it is. Oh yeah, well, in TI four, yeah, in in fourth edition, yeah, nothing. All your trade stuff has no value until you trade it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that. I think that adds. You know, I don't know. Yeah, on one hand, it is artificial, as Matt says, but it does, in terms of the game, I think it, well, it's fine. It, it works really well. Well, I'm thinking of Sidereal. It works extremely well because the resources cr created with donations, as they're called, are valuable resources um, that, you know, play the same role in the economy of the game that any other resource or it, a resource that comes from any other place. So even what you actually create yourself though, you generally don't want also. So not only your donation resources, but even the things coming out of your engine are generally right. useless to you. So just overall yeah. you're creating things that yeah. you don't actually need and you basically have to trade in order to make useful. Which yeah. is kind of which is interesting. Yeah, I mean Sidereal is a great Trading game, I think we'd all agree. Yeah. Just because it does create this kind of complex economy. Would we all agree that that's our favorite of those? Yeah, I think so. Even more than Chinatown for you, Ben? Um, they're different. They fill different niches. Yeah. Just mostly because of the length. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm honestly not sure what my favorite of these are. Because I think... It's one of my favorite games overall. That we've ever played. Yeah. But that's... Yeah. All right. That's... <laughs> and I cannot wait till the new art version comes out. Oh, my like, goodness. I think later in 2020. That it's going to be Have so you guys nice. seen the art, the cover? No. It's like, you know how... Was, okay. So you know how the art now is awful? I don't remember... Uh, I have only... Yes, I, I, I know that. Art. It's not awful. It's actually kind of good. <laughs> actually, <laughs> I thought it looked really good. Is it it was almost like, Ryan Lockett-esque. Is it going to have the same cubes and... I don't know. Like, I think all we've the seen cubes so far are is the very all the cubes and the colors and yeah, slightly yeah. different shapes that yeah. were kind of yeah. They're, yeah. they're eff effective, but mm. could probably be improved. Yeah, could be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, no, okay. That might be so a, that might I, be an expense thing, but we'll see. I want to get back to the artificial yeah point to kind of force I think trade. it works in Sidereal, for instance, because there is such an interesting economy. Within the game. So, injecting these kind of artificial 
this artificial value kind of works as kind of like simulating an outside effect on that economy. Yeah. It works in Trade on the Tigris to a lesser extent. Well, I think it's valuable in Trade on the Tigris as a kicker. Because on Trade on the Tigris, it's a lot sure. more straightforward yeah. to understand the value of something to you in terms of victory points. And those extra force trade cards tend to be like half point values. Yeah, yeah. you generally aren't trading that one for one with something. It's an added on. It's a, yeah, it's a kicker. Um, which I think the game probably is better for. Yeah, I, I definitely. Yeah. I, I wonder, because I think some of those cards probably end up giving you more than a point. I wonder if maybe we were just undervalued. Because there's one that's literally just one point. Um, all of the ones that... But doesn't it come from a higher-ranked development card? I don't remember. Um, I think it does. Maybe, maybe like, a level two, two, possibly. But it was, like, yeah, I guess it... Yeah, it was was a kicker that... Yeah, okay. Sure. I'm pretty sure that the move one direction on the religion track is a level one card. And that was the one that we most seem to most care about. Yeah, Yeah, that one's pretty good. It, and it's interesting because I think... But it's not as good as a, as a card that has a resource and moves you one on that track. Yeah, but it is a known quantity. So, I, I don't know. I yeah. think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. I think And we know that you have that card, and that if you give us that card, the, then it's going to be that card. Yeah, the value fluctuates. Because, honestly, I had one of those cards in the first time game we played where I couldn't give it away. It just happened that I was the only one who really wanted that. Well, so that the, the, the difference was you were locked into a particular right. direction. Yeah. And with this yeah. one, yeah. it was you know, either direction. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think the value is is variable, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. So but, I think but you know, I, games I, I like can your... kind of artificially nudge trading, but I think the most satisfying things come about when the trade is just a natural result of different strategies yeah. and and trying to specialize because then that also although it kind of it's kind of backwards based on real life economies where you're in what you're getting you, you specialize your labor in order to get something to trade with in this case you generally get a dispersed set of trading goods and you end up trying to specialize but it somehow feels similar i guess it's just the opposite direction yeah which is interesting. Another aspect I find interesting about these training games is that they're largely barter based instead of money based. And in economics, you learn that kind of money is something that develops over time. Like, yeah. there's a natural way to get to money. And it ends up when bartering kind of breaks down because bartering requires what's called a double coincidence of wants. In other words, you not. Like, you have to want what they want, and they have to want what you want, or what you have, rather. And finding that is difficult. So money then develops as a medium to where, okay, if we have everyone wanting the money, then you can always trade. Yeah. Um, But in these board games, I think just because the set of goods is small, and to some degree you you can find a way to want anything... Or not want something, yeah. It, it tends to work fine. I mean, even in Sidereal, which I think has the most unique resources of any of the games we're talking about, it's still less than ten. Yeah, or close to ten. But then some of the games, like Chinatown's, just the spots and your money. Yeah, which is in a game, I guess, a currency is victory points, right? Everyone wants them equally, or they have equal value essentially to everyone each unit. Yeah. But then it's interesting from an from an economic perspective that in a game like Trade on the Tigris, we do a lot of bartering instead of just paying for things. Yeah, yeah. When it's when you have so, an option, but Sidereal doesn't let you. True. Yeah. Now um, we. I don't know if that matters. We played tra- Trade on the Tigris twice, and I think more so in the second game and more so in later rounds, we were starting to trade victory points straight up. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... Maybe that's, that's something that, that will develop as we play that game yeah, more. Yeah, that's emergent I, in well, the way that you described. it becomes much more apparent about, I think, like, how much 
things are valued in terms of points and and you're seeing how, how where you're actually going to end up on the track and so what points it's going to relate you to and so i think offering money for things is is much more reasonable because you understand the actual point effect especially in the very last round you know what physically that's going to make an effect i i think there may be kind of a psychological element to it as well because when you so as as a person who has knowledge of my hand and trade of the tigers I know that if I get this, it will be worth two points to me. If I offer one one point for it, then that's a good deal for me. If I offer a card that I can't use for anything, that's a better deal. Because if I can if I can trade a card away that will get me zero points, like why would I not do that when I can you know, if my option is to but that's not psychological, that's 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 economizing. So maybe there's just situations in which because the set of resources is so small, the economy, like the actual, without any psycho, like self psychological foolery, like the actual, I forget what the term is, like the actual gap between what you lose and what you gain is wider when you barter a lot. But it could be a psychological effect in terms of yeah. loss aversion. I, I was thinking, yeah, on the other end of it, like when you uh, when someone's offering you a deal. Oh, if it, I, I think I would be much more inclined to. Choose goods just because. Well, maybe I can get yeah. something. You know, it's the uh, first try. Get rid of what you it, get it's, rid of. It's, it feels it's, there's, bad. A, there's, there's potential there. It's like, oh yeah. well, if he gives me this, maybe I can turn it into that. Um, where it, you know, instead of just getting the the straight up victory points, it feels which, bad to give a victory point to someone. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's yeah. a loss of thing. I, I right? totally agree with that. Where, but and I, have... I feel like it also kind of feels bad to get a victory point because it's. It you know exactly it goes, what it, it is. goes into your pile and yeah. you can't do anything it, it, else. With it, it has yeah. it has zero potential. It's all realized. So interesting. I don't know how it works, but there, there's a lot of interesting factors there. It's also again kind of the opposite of real life, where in in a game victory points feel so significant, like your money yeah. feels so significant. Yeah. Um, I think just because of the nature of a game ending and like counting your victory points, but in real life, like. You're oftentimes your like physical possessions, even after the exchange, feel more weighty to your life and significant more than the value, like the money. Yeah, like yeah the money feels like something. Card. Like when you're paying something in cash, is a lot harder to afford. Oh, that's another way to look at it, right? A card, if you have to like physically to touch it, yeah. People spend less money when they're using cash compared to a credit card. Yeah, I don't I don't know the answers there, but it's a lot of interesting levels of loss aversion to think about. There was an interesting situation in in the last round of our game of Trade on the Tigress where I had two fish and I was telling Lindsay that the the uh well, the the attached effects of these two fish were both things that she wanted. And I realized that I did not want any goods back. I did not want to take on the risk of what might be attached with those goods. And so I told her, I'll just give you these two fish that I'm telling you you want their effects. How many victory points will you give me? With, uh, with the understanding that this game you're allowed to d- deceive on the actual... Yeah, you know, so we yeah. should explain. Every card, so. <laughs> or almost every card you can trade, will have a good on it, which is a set collection thing, and then another... Like bonus attached yeah. to it, which, which which is something that each individual will value more or less in, in various right. Almost always, there's Almost always. there's some purely negative, but most of them are. And according to the rules, you cannot lie about which good you're trading, but you can lie about yeah. what's on the bottom part of the card. So so, so anyway, I, I'm yeah. I'm interested in like what was the calculus in your mind? Actually, I think I said. I will just give you these two fish for three victory points. I think it was two victory points. Or was it three? It was three. It was three. So, so I knew, I'm curious what the calculus was. In I mind. was going to net seven points out of that. Just from completing a big... Completing a set of fish, and also because of the loyalties, I would get ex- I would move up on the tracks um, yeah. exactly three, three points each. So you and were so, counting 
on me telling the truth. Correct. Sure. And I and we did pinky promise, just so everyone's aware. <laughs> and I hold those very true to my heart. So what does that, that you know, probably not. But the that... game rules do not do not specify anything <laughs> yes. about pinky promises. <laughs> and, and also incidental like, to the pinky promise. The, the first, I was telling the truth. Well, there the, was the first also... game of this that we played, Matt lied. His butt off to me, like, to every me. trade. <laughs> to, I think to all of us, but yeah, probably m- 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 more to you. So I also didn't have much to lose in that I could have just hidden them away. So sure. it was kind of yeah. a no lose situation okay. where I was either going to okay. gain seven points. So or so in your mind, really you, you were like, "This is a a net." You're, you're net more than doubling your points. Yeah. If I'm telling the truth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, well, the lose was you lose the three points to Matt. Yeah. If I'm telling the truth. Is, if, is he's lying. if he's lying. If he's lying, yep. Yeah. I lose three points, the and then I net. So you were, you were gambling. Yeah. Is Tigris the only one of these games Deceptive. that has this. Deceptive. Um, deceptive um, aspect tied to the trade? I guess technically in Catan, could you just give someone a. No, you, you have to you be. Physically, have to. You have to be. Up Isn't right. there something? I think Sidereal, You have to. The immediate trade has to be truthful. If you make a future promise, you can break it. Oh, I don't know if I. Yeah. Trading on the tigers, I think, actually forbids future promising. But I think in Sidereo, you can break future promises. I don't know about Chinatown. But there's something really interesting about that immediate unknowable. Yeah. Well, it really players. spices the game up. I like that. That might be my favorite part of Trade on the Tigress, actually. There's the extra cards, yeah. too, that, because you're normally only allowed to, you know, lie on the bottom part of the card, but then there's random cards, spl- or was it one card, that's splashed in there that allows you to lie about anything. And so you never oh, yes. know who's going to have yeah. Yeah. that part of the card, and so that's it. The lapis you know, card. You know what this the, actually... Oh, <laughs> the, the lapis. It wasn't a lapis. Well, the, it got traded the, as a lapis twice. For the folks at home. It was not a lapis. <laughs> yeah. There's one card in the game that just says you can call this whatever you want, it's, basically. It's all red. Yeah. You put it in your hand and it's just this nasty I, red card. Wait, who had that? And why didn't they try to trade it to me? Because I totally would have taken it. I thought I Matt it was going to... It went from Lindsay to me to Matt. Why didn't like, you trade that quick. to me, Matt? And then I think Matt tried to give it to you, and it didn't work. It was like round three, I think. Oh, you, you, I think you wanted too much for it, if it's the thing I'm thinking of. The hard part is that you know, Maybe also, at some point, you know who has it. And so also, I didn't, I didn't know that it came from Lindsay originally, okay. so I tried pretty hard to you trade it to Lindsay. It. So maybe I just assumed that you... I yeah, knew no. that you had it, though, You so. You overheard yeah. the conversation with I did Lindsay. indicate to Lindsay that you had it, because I thought you were leading at that point. Yeah, there's also an aspect. So the the situation with the fish and the victory points is interesting because there was such a large gap there. But there was such a large gap for agreement, like excluding the 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 risk of deception costs, right? Like three, four, five, six victory points probably means Lindsay makes the trade, or two through five perhaps, which is a huge gap. And I wonder. Well, I don't I, know I, it, it, for that thing. I net. Two points and she nets eight. Yeah. Or seven. She nets seven. seven. Yeah. But I'm saying there's a large that that trade, depending on what like the first offer was, like that, that trade could have been valued many different ways. And I don't know I haven't studied that dynamic. I wonder if Amber has any knowledge about that because you have studied negotiation. What happens when, like, is there a tactic you learn in negotiation for the situation where just the way the the desires line up, the the price or whatever, the cost, whatever you want to call it, could be a huge range and it would still be accepted by both parties? Have you read anything about that, Amber? That's just the classic situation where you don't want to be the one who makes the first offer. Oh, I see. You, you wait for them to offer. A lot of times it is fine to make the first offer in negotiations. But if it's the situation where you know that both parties are going to be fine with a wide range, you're trying to maximize your own, I don't know, your own value that you're getting out of the trade, you want the other person to make the first offer so you know what they're thinking. 
And then if you don't think it's high enough, then you might offer way more. But if you think it's acceptable, maybe you just offer a little bit more. Okay. Mm. So there's nothing tricky or fancy about yep. it. It's about what I, you would expect. I don't think so. No, and that's yeah. super interesting. Because um, I, th- I like would... Like, if you one... had asked four, like, would I have considered it? Yeah, would you have? Maybe, since it was net seven. I think that seems too high for a, yeah. the re- how many points actually end up getting scored in the yeah. game. But that, yeah, if you had said four, maybe we would have done the... Or maybe if you had said five, maybe we would have done the deal for four or something. I wish you had made the first offer. Because, mm-hmm. in my mind, I wasn't sure that you would accept three. Interesting. Yeah, I know. That's cool. I, so I really like... I mean, I, th- this situation comes about because of the hidden element in Tigris, in Trade on the Tigris. I, I had a thought of another game that has deceptive um, hidden trading information, uh, which is not really a trading game, but Sheriff of Nottingham. I was thinking of this, Ben. Because it, it's not strictly trading, but you can put a number of goods into your bag, and then you can tell the sheriff you can have this specific good that's in this bag, it, which is basically sense, trading. Oh, it is. It's, you're trading that good for an action, yeah, which, you're, is, you're which tra- is a trade. Yeah. Um, and then, like, if you're lying about it, then the sheriff is just out of luck. Um, it, it's, it's a really... That's a very good point. Yeah, it's... I, I don't know if I would call that... I think that's somewhere between I mean, Catan and the rest of... If you start getting into that, then you just... You open the door to, like, any and all. Everything's a trade. Like, the resistance. Well, like, no, like, like, but there's... Like, you, like, you can yeah. specifically... Every game's an auction game. Yeah. You can specifically say, like, I will give you this yeah. or that. Yeah. Like, yeah. you'll say, I'll give you $2 not to open the bag. That's a trade. That's absolutely a yeah. trade. Yeah. So... That that, yeah, that, should, go. that should go Add on that the, list, to the list somewhere below Catan and somewhere above everything else, I think. <laughs> i put it above Catan. <laughs> what? No. Matt! No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> the, final, <laughs> the final interesting aspect of trade in board games is that because we have the reality that there's a single winner in all of these games. Um, so what that means is that the games... Ha- Essentially, you have to hide some aspect of your victory, or else you get to a situation where, like in Catan, no one wants to trade with you. Okay, Mark playing himself as the victim. Or, or in Trade on the Tiger from last game, me yeah. playing myself as the loser. The, the loser. Which, which you, I was. Which you were. I, I, was, <laughs> I wasn't I was as convinced as I made myself out to be, but I was fairly convinced I was in last place, and uh, took seven points away from Ben. And gain seven points, and Ben still won. So, but whatever. So the games have to hide. So in Chinatown, you your your money is hidden, which is your victory points. In Sidereal, your victory points are hidden. In Trade of the Tigress, your victory points are hidden. In Catan, any victory points you have on cards will be hidden. It's it's pretty apparent. It's pretty open. Who's kind of yeah. But that leads us to now the design difficulties with trading. In a trade game. And this is a difficulty we've, I've talked about before. The single winner problem. In that when you have an economic game. The fact that there is a single winner. Doesn't really. It's it's not congruent with. The realities of economics in real life. Where except for some very awful horrible people. You're not looking for everyone else to lose. You're just looking to gain. And when you have trade. Both sides gain. Or both sides think they're gaining, at least. Well, I don't know. You hear about contests of the super rich all the time. Who can be the most networked so they can have bragging rights over the others. I kind of look at it that way. Well, those would be the super awful people I'm talking about. they're not asking everyone else to lose. They just want to do a little bit better than everyone else. Yeah. That's the exception I mentioned. But but it it is part of the real world. It's... It's not like when you look at trade in the real world, it's all yeah, but rainbows even, and butterflies. I mean, by volume, that's minuscule. What, what I mean... There's still here's, this element of winning saying. in the real world. Yeah. Here's what I'm saying. Like, we talk about competition in economics and in the marketplace, and that's absolutely true. But all else being equal, most people would not take a lesser amount of profit in order for their competitor to lose more than they would just take the larger profit amount. Right, so that level of spite 
doesn't isn't overcome with most people, I, I think, I, I think, by just pure profit incentive. I, I think you are thinking of this as an economist, thinking of the rational person. I think in the real world, there's a great deal of this same thing that's mirrored in the board game, where maybe you're not looking at all your competitors to lose, but maybe you are willing to lose a little bit, so they'll lose a little bit more. Just so you're... At, Staying on top of that. I don't think that's a common phenomenon. I, I, mean, I, don't th- I, I, think, I think it's you... far less common than the stereotype. Okay. But there's also yeah. the complication that perhaps they think that taking that relative loss yeah. will result in longer in, in long term gain. Yeah. Which is a different which is just another factor into it. But I don't think there are that many people out there who are motivated by spite. And in a board game, because there's a single winner, you are motivated by spite. Spite? Is, is, it, yeah. is it that much? A type of spite, basically. In, in most gaming groups, is that a huge No, motivation? spite in the sense that it's zero sum. So, well, in a two player game, it's zero sum. And in multiplayer games, right. it's more yeah. complicated. You have deltas. In, in a multiplayer game, people. I frequently. I, in a multiplayer player trading game, I'm frequently thinking, I think that person is in the lead. The most important thing is for me to to increase the delta against that person. Sometimes that means taking fewer points. For example... We all ganked up on Ben last game. Yeah, Yeah. I, I, I was offering Mark all kinds of trades and not even listening to what came out of Ben's mouth. There, there was no way that I was going to increase Ben's value by trading with him. Even though that was probably the more valuable trade for me. I don't know. I don't know that I play games this way in our group. I think it's Maybe. Seen, Some people I think don't. It looks it's like not, I do. It's not required. Um, yeah. But it's kind of an assumption within the game bubble in, of yeah. that people are trying to come in first. Yeah, that, that, incens- that incentive is there. There's an incentive to win. Whereas in the real world, I think it's much more frequent that people are trying to get as many victory points as they can, regardless of how many victory points yeah. other people get. Like if I was just looking to score the highest, I would have we would have possibly or like you were oh. we would have possibly traded with Ben at that point because we would have been able to maybe get better deals. Um, but at the end of the day, we wanted to kind of increase all of our chances of possibly winning and so we just didn't trade with Ben because we knew he was in the league. Yeah, so you yeah. are right. But there, like the there was like some explicit talk of like Oh yeah. Like here's the here are the strategy things that we can do. We dumped all our culture on Mark because it did none of us any good all separated. But a business would be more focused on like increasing their own personal profit over yeah. yeah. Typically well, you typically. guys do you guys think that I, I'm not aware of any legacy trading game. But do you think that we would approach trading differently if we knew that it had value? I, I'm thinking about this mostly in the context of fantasy sports, because um, I'm in a I'm in a keeper league right now. Yeah, and that's been really interesting this year because you're allowed to trade draft picks. Yeah, uh, which which like prioritizing the, the 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 present over the future or vice versa. Um, it, it's it's something that's really interesting and has kind of sports is a in, it is an awesome franchise management is an awesome little trade micro oh it's like, a, it's a because yeah. well I mean I've I've had in the back of my mind an actual board game concept about this yeah. about the varying motivations because the owner wants to maximize profit the Coach wants to keep his job. The players want to win championships and get large contracts. Like, everyone wants to win the championship a lot, but, like... Some people want it more. Some people... Like, yeah. the, I would argue that a player probably on now is more... A player wants to win a championship more than they care about the profitability of the team. But they probably care about their own personal profitability more than they want the championship. In many It cases. depends. It yeah. depends. Yeah. There are a lot of players who are motivated a lot by the prestige yeah. of yeah. the championship. Yeah, but great, great incentives oh, it's all all super around. Super fascinating, and, and like the idea of like tanking, for instance, like if Suck you like. <laughs> if you as a fan want to win championships, you should want your team to be like 
in the top group of teams or the worst team in the league. Yeah, the middle is not as good. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. Yeah. Because that maximizes your either your chances this year or your game for the future. Yeah. Well, let me pause here real quick. <laughs> you know, we are talking about people as, like, profit maximizing. Uh, but it's important to note, it's, it's very, very important to note in defense of the study of economics that the idea of economists always looking at people as, like, money-driven is not true. The whole basis of economics that we've discovered over a long time with different theories of value is that value is just purely subjective. Mm -hmm. And so when I mention, like, profit-seeking or maximizing value, that's based on understanding that what people value can be very ethereal things like family or security or nos nostalgia, <laughs> right? It's not necessarily or spite. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a physical thing. That really throws your earlier statement for a loop when, when the spite is the profit. <laughs> No, that's that's the exception. I said except for some very horrible people. Okay, okay. Who would value spite that much. Uh, it's typically another way. Sure. Uh, but it also factors into games, too. Like, there, well, are, sure. there are some people There's that I, I, w I would lie to much less than other people, just to preserve the relationship. Someone needs when, a lesson on the game when bubble. You're, when, when, you're, <laughs> when you're playing with your with your little brother, maybe don't manipulate him to the okay. full extent possible. Fair, well, fair, especially fair. since he's like a state champion wrestler now. Okay, well, now he's now he's an adult. He's fair game. But you know, when he was little, you, you didn't get away with it to the maximum extent possible because you could get away with a whole lot. Oh, was um, was little Nathan super gullible? Gullible. I don't know. So you, you all have to understand Amber's family. She is one of six girls, all older than the lone boy. He's fine. <laughs> He's totally fine. Um, we but, should ask him that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and then there, there are certain tactics that work with some people and don't work with others. So the people element in the game bubble is still important. It's not just about maximizing the profit in the moment. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of meta stuff that goes on, which is all part of economics also, which is exciting. No matter where you slice it, there's economics. I should put, it out, I should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Anyways, in board games, because of the single winner problem, problem in quotation marks, uh, you have to obscure victory points. And I think... Yeah. One of the reasons I like Sidereal a lot is because it does the best at that. Like, it's really hard to figure out who's winning that game. The second problem with trading is that it takes a long time. Or des or designer... Yeah. What did I call it? The, the hurdle, obstacle, consideration? I don't know. Problem's too harsh of a word. Something that you yeah. have to factor in when you, if you're designing a trade game is that it takes a long time. It takes longer than you think. I mean, yeah. the most common solution is to put a time limit on it. Yeah, which a lot of these games do. I think Train the Tigers and Sidereal encourage a time limit, but don't specifically say you have to, according to the rules. I think Catan is... Catan does the thing where you can only trade with the yeah, active player. Yeah, so. it's turn-based. It's turn-based. That, that makes it a lot shorter, because it, it becomes really readily apparent that there are no trades that can happen. Yeah. I, I think TI4 is like that as well. Um, where you can only trade with the person who turn currently is. And trading is a lot less of a thing in TI4. You also have to be physically adjacent to them, so right. it takes a while to develop to that part. Yeah. But, like, you can, they have all the, um, like, not only the trade goods, but also the the cards that you can trade away. Yeah. Um, um, and then Chinatown is just simple enough. Mm -hmm. Like, it's simple enough that you quickly come to a point that you've exhausted it. So the solutions I found to this problem is simplicity, instituting time limits, or just lean into it. Like, just, you know, this is a big, long game like Sidereal. Lean into it. It's going to be big and epic and awesome. For me, this is a tension in that when 
when there are time limits, I end up, I think I enjoy those, the games less. There's a conflict there for me as the player, just because I enjoy trading, but it takes a long time. But if that's capped, I have this kind of like internal tension and nervousness that I don't enjoy. And some people do enjoy that pressure. I enjoy it, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Is and that's what totally is about this pick time. I think the biggest uh, difference it's, it's not time, but they're like internal. No, pit has, pit's a different kind of chaos. Yeah. I, I think the biggest difference with timed trades is that it makes trading maybe a little bit easier to do because you have less time to dicker and to to kind like. You're going to be making some less optimal trades just so to make sure that you can create. You're, you're trading yeah, maybe. optimization for, or volume. maybe, or maybe you just you, you want to get more and don't do anything at all. I mean, that's maybe, that's also a possibility. Yeah, I think it depends on the weight of the decision. Like in settlers, if you need more than like five minutes to decide whether yeah. you want to trade a sheep for a brick, you know what I mean? Yes, but in, but in but trading think, the tigress, uh, like. When you're trying to calculate, like, okay, yeah. I have seven, I have six. But see, six, in, in Catan, it, it's when, it's, when it's your turn, it's easier to figure out what you want. Yeah, because you oh, have that, everything. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that, okay, that yeah, turn, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that decision is yeah. very, very easy and yeah, should not yeah. take you very long. Yeah. But you yeah. maybe in Scenario or in Trade Tigers or other games, like, I wonder there's, there's more involved than this. Okay, well, that sheep for brick seems like a, you know, seems like so, I need this. So. I, I wonder if this is why you rule books hardly ever say this is the time limit this is yeah. how the game is played because i think different people react to that pressure differently yeah. and it it greatly affects my enjoyment and, and i recognize that it's it's like it's a worse simulation that there's no time limit <laughs> but i enjoy it far more when there's no time limit like yeah. matt you and i like to win and you like to win by considering things carefully, and I like yes. to win by rushing to Wait, but yes, that's, yeah, that's, you really that's love uh, Space Alert, don't you? I love Space Alert, yes. <laughs> but it's different. I, but it's, it's, different. it's a different challenge. All right. Yeah. We're yeah. working together in Space Alert. Well, yeah. I mean, the difference, I think, to me with, like, Sidereal or, or Tigris, with or without a time limit, is that I would just approach it almost as a different game. Like, without the yeah. time limit, it's much more considered. With a time restriction, it's more about playing, like, pulling an amber, if I can say that, <laughs> and trying to win over based on personality and, and more, like, slimy negotiation tactics. I'm not slimy! <laughs> what is this? I'm not <laughs> saying you're slimy. I'm a very considerate negotiator. I'm saying well, if you only have a certain amount of time, it's going to be whoever's the loudest and whoever's the strongest <laughs> and whoever... Yeah, whoever can nominate the conversation the fastest and get what they want the quickest yeah. is going to do the best if there's a time limit. Yeah. If there's less time to reason. I, it's just... I think with time limits, too, you may also end up trading more with your physical neighbors. Just because it's easier to hear them. Uh, Absolutely, which, yeah. Which could be nah. interesting depending on who you're next to. Well, it's um, actually... And, like, I, what resources they have. Slight tangent. I actually listened to a Ludology podcast a couple weeks ago about this. I don't know when the podcast aired, but it's about a guy who did a... Who, I don't know if he did a, He's done a formal study, but he's looking into ideas about physical distance from the players and how it affects gameplay. Wow, interesting. It's the it's the podcast called like the Seven Zones of Play, I think. Mm. Something like that. And it was it was exactly that point. This actually really segues into my next challenge with designing a trade game is that the uncertainty of value. The idea that it's harder to understand it may be harder to understand the value of things. Uh, which can widen the gap between new players and experienced players. This oh. came about when Mark taught me Settlers of Catan. Oh, an experienced player. Wait, I taught you Settlers. Yes, Mark taught me Settlers of Catan, and I had no idea how to value these resources at all. And he just crushed the whole game because he was the most experienced. I don't remember this. It also happens when, again, playing with your younger siblings who are not... As able to make value judgments and being able to convince them that, hey, this trade is good for you when you know it's much Isn't better. Isn't that any game, though, when you play it? When, you for, when you're teaching know. someone a game? You can but easily think bulldoze can, them out Because of, of the level of interactivity, it can feel worse. Yeah. I think it can lead to people freezing a lot more. Mm. 
I, I think a lot of it too is when you're treating apples and oranges, but like things that are hard to compare with, an, with each other. I, I'm kind of referencing again the fantasy football because, like, I like this year. I you know trading players for future draft picks. Like, what's what's the value metric there? Because like well, it's you know, hard. Yeah, yeah. A pl- a player right now is worth you know if you're in competition for the you know the, the playoffs you know a player now could be valuable and if you win the playoffs like you get the it's a, it's a money league so you, you get the you know the payout at the end but you know a, a high round pick next year could set you up pretty nasty for next year um and like there's so, there's still uncertainty there but it's it's more likely that like a second like a second round pick will be Possibly better than the player you have this year because you get them for the whole year. I, I really like trading, like trying to find, try, trying to trying to estimate what values are when it's really hard to see. Um, yeah, well, with, it's I, very I fun. Think that's the thing that makes trading games so interesting. With Sidereal, for instance, I mean, you like especially the first time you play, like we all have the same items or, or tokens or whatever you'd like to call it. You know, but they're all worth different things. I mean, you guys know how I feel about, I don't know, about the podcast, but you guys know how I feel about asymmetrical games in general. I'm not a fan, <laughs> just for everyone. <laughs> but um, with that, even though the items are all worth the same, they're worth very different things to us as our inputs. So it is always yeah. harder to make that decision with a trade when, okay, well, that's not worth anything to me, but you don't exactly know what you're giving Ben when you're actually trading them yeah. with them. So it's harder to make a trade when you don't know the value of what that is to them. You only know the value of it in general and what it is to you. It's definitely harder to make that yeah. that call. Well, Sidereal has trades. an interesting solution there because it just flat out gives you a chart of kind of standard values of things. Mm-hmm. Except like, it gives you a cheat sheet. Except you still don't... You know that, but you still don't know precisely what it's valued to. You know that everyone player. has variation on that. Yeah. Which is presumably based on, like, everyone can assume it's based on the chances of that being supplied in the game. Right? That's like your supply curve. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. The other right. solution is just being simple. Like with Catan, you can kind of figure out things fairly easily. Yeah. Cheaper Somewhere in the middle, like, I can see. I don't know, Trade of the Tigers might be simple enough. Although we severely undervalued the value of the the permanent cards the first time through, I think. Um, the development cards? Development cards, yeah. Uh, so Maybe I, you did. Yeah, I was going to say... I won the I, game. <laughs> I, I spent my entire game trying to get to level 3. The first time? Yeah. Oh. Well, I lost both games. I think I came in fourth place both I, games. So. I think I think the problem for me was that the first game I was I was part of the majority who was trying to get to the the same thing for like the whole game. I think one of you guys switched to go. I, I switched I was, the other direction. I, I think I was Marduk and Democracy, which like three of the people. Yeah, were, were with. Another potential challenge with trade games is that. Uh, it can value aggressiveness and assertiveness among the players, which for some people could be a positive, like maybe that's the experience they want, but it can be, it can make the game more exclusionary to certain personality types, which is maybe not what you want as a publisher. I've played Settlers Online before, and the I will say the online trading is... A completely different experience than playing in person. Oh, because all you see is, I have this, I want this, and that's it. So, it, it, it there's there's absolutely no aggression. There's no like, it, it's just is this something I want? Eh, I don't think so. I don't want to do that trade. It, it, it takes a lot of the emotion or like the immediacy out of it, and it makes it a much more logical choice. Yeah, I mean, I don't... There's not a ton that you can set up as as a designer to kind of combat this problem. I, a lot of it has to be combated, I think, just by the people in, in the, group. the group. But you yeah. can put additional restrictions um, or make it a very minor part of the game. So Catan allowing, just forcing it so that only the active player can initiate trade 
gives them like exclusive time to shine. And so if there's someone who's much more shy or uncertain, it can it can help them initiate trades, which I think is very, very good. Um, you have Millennium Blades is interesting because if I remember correctly, and it's actually been a couple of years since I played this game, all the trade is indirect. So you first trade to like a center point on the table, and then someone can buy that card from the table. So you could set up trades, but it has to go through this intermediary. If I remember correctly, which can also... It's, it's the furthest away from like a pure person-to-person trading thing. Or you just make it a tiny part of a large game like Twilight Imperium. But then you're losing the pure trade. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I think so the, I think the best solution is perhaps the Catan one, where you have some mechanism to where a player can have the initiative, so to speak. Or you just say, hey, I want to do a free-for-all trading game, and if a lot of people, you know, if there's a chunk of people who are never going to play that, it's fine with me. Which like is Pip. a which is a perfectly fine choice. It's like Pip. Definitely. Like Pip. Well, you guys keep mentioning Pip. I don't know how Pip works. It's the game that we wanted it's, to play with you, Mark, yeah. where you basically yeah. are trading it's, it's a bunch set of collection. commodities. It's basic yeah. set so collection. So, the trade, the trade, and again, I have air quotes, all at once. you're only allowed to say a number of Basically, I have this many of a good that I'm not telling you. Huh. Um, you say three, three, you, three. And you find someone three, else three. who has three of something else that they want to trade. So the trade is more just you're buying the opportunity of seeing a different good. In your well, tr- p- potentially different. Potentially different <laughs> good. Um, and so you're, you know, you want to get all of the same good. Not to be a grumpy game critic, but that sounds awful. I mean... This is what you've said before, Mark. You never wanted to play. I'm not saying it's a good game, but the fun is in the chaos. Sure. (laughs) Okay, well that's Pip then. Okay, the final challenge is that if you institute trading, interpersonal trading in a game, it eliminates a lot of other options. Because trading is often going to be the most efficient way to exchange resources. Uh, so it's hard, in, especially in a Euro game, to make trading a minor part of the game. Hmm. Like, Catan has the 4-1 yeah. to one and 3-1 to one things, but if you can do a trade, you're going to do a trade, probably. I, I would also say, for Catan, they, they mitigate it a lot with the Monopoly card, too. That's because true. Because there's some pretty serious repercussions about letting it be known that you have a particular resource when you know that somebody could steal all of your stuff. Um, so there's there may be more of an incentive to look for other avenues of getting something, you also particularly when it's card. not your turn. Yeah, and you have a card limitation, so you can't. You right. can't well, hoard. it's a soft limitation though, because you can have more than no, seven. Fair, fair. It's, but as if, long if, as if seven is if, if no one rolls, yeah, if someone rolls Which a seven, it's only then, the most common moment. Right. Yeah. It's still on the push your luck. Seven out of or six out of thirty six or something. I think that there's a lot of interesting problems of adding trade as an element to an otherwise existing game. I think it's just very difficult. It, it's difficult. Without um, it all of a sudden becoming a trade game, and then it's like all this yeah, other stuff doesn't but it matter al- as much. It's also really dependent on what that game engine looks like. So, you know, how rigid is the, the Euro engine? If it's more rigid then trading more or less becomes, like, is there someone that has the exact same thing that I need, or the, the exact thing that I need for what I have? Um, and Catan kind of falls on that spectrum. Yeah. And that's easier to do in, like, a little develop than, than a more complex, open uh, engine economy game, where then... I think it has more of the problem that you said of once you open it up to trading, that is, you know, the most efficient way to gain an, an edge. Well, and it's in, I remember way back, way back when we first moved to Boston and we were just starting kind of really getting into board games, we were playing Power Grid. And I think at one point I commented that it would be really interesting to allow open trading in Power Grid. Yeah. I think it would make the game twice as long. Yeah. Because Power Grid has the problem of kind of maximizing when you hit certain power plants. Yes. 
and, and being able to just freely trade would just open up the possibility space of how you gain value. It might encounter a problem where everyone's just calculating everything to the dollar, which kind of already happens in Power Grid with the final couple auctions, and then eventually deciding that you can't make the trade because it gives you it gives them the marginal dollar over you, uh, so it might fail completely. But I don't know. Adding trading as a house rule is kind of an interesting idea. Again, it would probably double the length of most games because trading tends to dominate that much. Yeah. But it could also make, you know, if, if you love a game but you're getting a bit tired of it, make trading, maybe think about adding a trading element as a house rule to add some spark. I think it's interesting, but that's the economist in me. Heck, try it out in your relationships, you know? Yeah. I was going <laughs> to say around the dinner table, you know, yeah, maybe. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Can you buy green beans? Or you yeah, buy maybe maybe you should. And give an, I do that all the time. Maybe you should give an asymmetrical <laughs> distribution of the food at your dinner table to spice it up a little bit. That's what happens at restaurants. Amber and I will get will strategically plan to get two different dishes so we can split it in half and trade because we want to eat both dishes. It's mm-hmm. true. That's economic activity that's, and it's very efficient. That's great. Mm-hmm. Full support. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. All right, that's our podcast for today about interpersonal trading. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you for everyone here for uh, staying around after our game night to record. I'm glad we got a big group of people to contribute. This worked out really well, I think. I've been scared of the past of large groups, but this this was far less scary than I thought it would be. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on social media. I'm now on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you look up The Thoughtful Gamer, you'll find it there. We are looking for questions for an upcoming yet-to-be-determined time Q&A podcast. We've gotten some really cool questions so far, but we need more. So if you have questions for any of us, even people who aren't on a lot, like Lindsay, maybe we could, if you address a question to Lindsay, maybe we can get Lindsay dragged over here to do that (laughs) podcast. Because obviously she then has to and has no choice in the matter because someone has specifically addressed her. Or whoever you want to ask your question of or just yes. general questions. Uh, general you, topics include baking, <laughs> Instagram. Do you have any uh, baking combination board game Yeah, questions? Lindsay is a professional baker. Yeah, so, so board games, baking, yeah, those food chain magnet, you know, I guess that's where, <laughs> that's where the Have you played there with us? Lie. No, I have not. Oh, man. Oh, we should um, yeah, yeah, that's probably yeah. the most relevant game that I can think of. But yeah, baking questions. There we go. New podcast segment. <laughs> Watch, I get like a hundred baking questions now. <laughs> this is no. We just have a separate podcast. baking. Po- <laughs> we are coming up on Thanksgiving. It is the time to have. Oh, all true. The yeah. so, the th- th- Lindsay, what is your favorite Thanksgiving pie? Oh, that's a t- so I hate apple pie, and I what? know I'm Lindsay. I know that's you know. You hate life and yeah, rainbows and I puppies. Hate, you know, I hate cats in America. Um, you know, I hate Lindsay. happy bubbles. They're the worst. Um, happiness, it's terrible. Um, what about yeah. apple cranberry? Yeah, no, just apple pie is just a tragedy. It just Wait, why? Not, yeah, what it just because it? it's just mushy apples. Like who? All wants right, well that's do all of the baking right, opinions Lindsay. that I need to hear. What what pies do you like? They're so, all mushy. The good ones. So key lime pie. That's mushy. No, it's creamy. It's different. It's totally <laughs> different. Completely different. That's not a Thanksgiving um, pie, unless Evelyn you're in and I will the keys. Pumpkin pie is legit. Ah, pumpkin Lindsay! Pie is very good. <laughs> pumpkin, pumpkin pie is the pie. worst pie. Pumpkin like, pie is the definition of mushy. Have mushy-y. you seen my outfit today? I'm wearing like a brown fall sweater with like tan pants, like a leopard like headband. Clearly, I love pumpkin pie. Like, what? This is, Pum- I'm a, pumpkin pie? I like I'm the a... color of pumpkin pie. It doesn't mean it's not the most mediocre pie. Yes. Is, pumpkin pie so is like the definition of mediocrity. You just have not had good yeah. pumpkin pie. But pumpkin pie, chocolate cream pie. That's also, not a Thanksgiving pie. But it's pie. I feel like chocolate, all pies are Thanksgiving Chocolate pies. just shouldn't be in pie. Do you like any fruit pies that aren't pumpkin? Chocolate, yes, cherry chocolate pie already has cake. It's actually very good. Cher- strawberry rhubarb is good, but that's not a Thanksgiving pie. That's a summer mm-hmm. pie. Very, very pie in general is very good. But yeah, mm. I don't wow. Know. This is very. We could definitely have a very contentious podcast about pie. Yes, and we can include pie the number as well. We can just make it all inclusive. I don't even know where I was in this conclusion. Uh, Patreon support <laughs> us. We'll uh, give you pie. <laughs> that's we'll send pie. Maybe. <laughs>
<laughs> Asterisk maybe. Asterisk if you're a patron, we'll send you by. Uh, I think that's it. I don't know. <laughs> Give us ratings on iTunes. The end. And we'll give you pie! No, Ben! <laughs> Goodbye, everyone! <laughs>